Hey, have you heard any good books lately? This is Talking Audiobooks, your weekly podcast for all news, discussion, and opinions surrounding the wonderful world of audiobooks. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and good night. Wherever you are, whenever you may be listening, this is the Talking Audiobooks podcast, season number two, episode number 12, my very favorite number. And I am your host, the man with the face made for radio and the voice made for print, Casey Trowbridge. And as always, I am happy to be with you. I'm going to keep my opening comments brief this week because of our interview. We are joined by audiobook narrator Sean Pratt. Sean has narrated over 900 audiobooks, and folks, that is something that you do not do by accident or by mistake. If you get to 900 audiobooks, it's because companies find you reliable, it's because they find that you do quality work, It's because you are persistent and aggressive at marketing your talents and uh, yourself. And it is because people enjoy listening to you. And you are going to enjoy listening to this interview. This is easily the longest interview we've had on Talking Audiobooks so far. This is even longer than the interview that I did when I was a guest back in December. The reason that this interview is so long is because it is so good. We just kept going and going. Sean is a great interview subject because I asked him a question and he just ran with the answer and I didn't have to poke and prod for more information. He was off and running and that's the type of interview that I like to do because as I tell people before I interview them every week, uh, the people that have already subscribed to this podcast hear me all the time and the people who are going to download the podcast because they want to hear your interview want to hear more of you than they do of me and that is true here and you'll hear a lot from sean and uh, i don't even want to spoil all the topics we get into because there's just so many ways that this interview uh, goes so many directions it's really a lot of fun Uh, there's you know some humor in it as well and it's just a tremendous interview. Sean has accumulated eight earphone awards from Audiophile Magazine, and he has been nominated for an Audi on five different occasions. So I think you're going to really appreciate this interview. This is uh, tremendous, tremendous stuff. You are going to learn why Sean is the Ginger Yoda, and I am quite confident in that statement. So I encourage you to settle in, grab your favorite beverage, put your feet up. Unless you're at work, then maybe don't drink and put your feet up, but just settle in and get comfortable because this one is a lot of fun. After the interview is over, I'll be back with some more comments and I'll play you some excerpts of Sean's narration that have caught my ear over the years. And we will do that shortly. But before we do that, I want to tell you all to check out our Facebook page at facebook.com slash talking audiobooks. Find us on Twitter at talking audio. I am at audiobook Casey on Twitter, Goodreads and Facebook. You can find me there. And I do hope you uh, check out all of those resources so you can find out the latest on the happenings with the talking audiobooks podcast and our giveaways that we do on a regular basis. And speaking of all of that stuff, I'm going to turn it over to producer Ken here shortly, and he's going to bring you a word, a promotional spot. And then what we are going to do after that is we're going to go into my full interview with Sean Pratt. So here's a word from producer Ken, and I'll be back with Sean right after this. For you, the listeners of the Talking Audiobooks podcast, Audible is offering a free audiobook download with a free 30-day trial to give you the opportunity to check out their service. 
To download your free audiobook today, go to audibletrial.com forward slash talking audiobooks. Again, that's audibletrial.com forward slash talking audiobooks for your free audiobook. And now back to your host, Casey Trowbridge. And we're back and as I said in the intro, we have uh, Sean Pratt with us, and he has narrated over 900 audiobooks. In fact, I think I saw on your social media page the other day that you have hit 930 now. That's correct. That's, that's unbelievable. It sort of blows my mind every time I think about it. But, yeah, so I, I was adding up my uh, my uh, invoices for the year for so far, and uh, – Sure enough, my, for when I was looking at the contracts, I had done 930. So I was, I was, uh, yeah, <laughs> a little flummoxed to say the least. Well, you know, you don't accidentally narrate 930 audiobooks. You know what I mean? <laughs> no, no. And I also tell people, I tell my students, uh, that I, you know, I, I, I'm not on contract with anybody. I get those one book at a time. So it's a matter of, you know, establishing a reputation with a publisher like Blackstone or Tantor, and then delivering on that promise every single time, and but also going out and looking for other work, and then sometimes having work find you, you know, through social media like Twitter or Facebook or so on. But uh, yeah, it's it's one at a time. To get to 930 audiobooks, you have to start out at one. <laughs> Take us back. I believe you've been doing this for 21 years, and you've been in show mm-hmm. business for over 30. So take us back and uh, explain to some of the listeners who probably don't know how you got into narrating audiobooks in the first place. Well, it started uh, back in 1994. Uh, I had been in New York for so about four years doing classical theater. That was what I, I started acting in theater when I was 10 and went off to get my acting degree, my BFA. In acting and uh, at the College of Santa Fe in New Mexico, went to New York and I wanted to become a classical theater actor and that's pretty much what I did. And I worked off Broadway with the Pearl Theater and then at regional theaters around the country. And then in 1994, I went down to Washington D.C. to do um, a play down there, a big monster production of uh, Henry the Fourth, parts one and two. And it was during that play, it was an enormous cast, I think we had like 40 actors involved, that I met David Hilder, who's now a playwright in uh, New York City, and we were sitting back in the green room uh, one day, early on, and I asked him the universal question actors always ask each other when we're killing time, which is, what do you do when you're not working? And he said, I narrate audiobooks. And I said, what's that? I had no idea. I mean, I knew what an audiobook was in the abstract. I'd seen them at the libraries and so on. And I, uh, um, uh, I, I worked, uh, uh, you know, but I'd never seen anybody work on one. Or I'd never, you know, knew that it was really a viable, something you could actually do. Um, and so we, we sat down over a cup of coffee and he explained it to me. And I thought it was very interesting, but I didn't really have a, a, a notion to try it. I was working, you know, pretty steadily as a theater actor at that time. And, uh, I, uh, I thanked him for his time and he said, well, listen, if you ever end up down here, give me a holler and I can introduce you to some people. And sure enough, two years later, I moved down to Washington DC and, uh, I was sort of at loose ends. I thought I'd lined up some work, some theater work to get me through the transition down to D.C., and it fell through at the last second, and I was really at loose ends. And so I called David, and he uh, introduced me uh, to a man named Grover Gardner, which some of your listeners may know. And uh, so Grover's a really well-known and respected uh, audiobook narrator and producer and director. He works for Blackstone Audio and has for many, many years. So I I called Grover and I said, uh, uh, you know, David, you know, told me to give you a call. I said, yeah, come over next Wednesday in the afternoon. I said, great. So I show up at his house at the edge of D.C. there. I was living in Virginia at the time. And uh, it's about, I don't know, 1130 in the morning. Knock on the door and 
here this guy comes. He looks like a, at that time, he looked like a very young Ed Herman, sort of tall with these real round glasses. But he was still in his pajamas with his hair all askew and having a cup of coffee and a cigarette with his newspaper under his arm. And he's like, oh, yeah, I forgot you were coming. Come on in. Come on in. And so he made a pot of coffee and uh, we started talking. He, had, he said he had been recording down in his studio this, when, I, when I knocked on the door. And so over the course of the morning – uh, a couple of things became very clear. Here was an actor who worked at home as an actor um, doing audio books uh, when he wanted to work and getting paid really good money to do it. And I thought to myself, you know, I don't know how to do this, but I'm going to learn because I'm really tired of hanging sheetrock because I was a carpenter. That's how I got through college and that was my day job in between plays. And so I um, – uh, I I joke with Grover uh, that if he had known what was about to happen to him, he probably should have thrown me off his porch because after he'd spoken to me for a while, we made, we cut a little demo and he said, "Yeah, I'll shop it around, see what's you know, see if there's any interest." And I proceeded to pull, call this poor guy like three times a week, or I'd happen to be in the neighborhood of his house and like, "Hey, I just happened to be by. You, Harry, look, I I got a bottle of scotch. Would you like to have a sip?" You know, I. I, I, I cajoled, I, I, th I don't know, I didn't threaten him, but I did everything short of, you know, just, I bugged this poor guy to death. And, um, until in an act of desperation, he contacted Books on Tape and Blackstone Audio. And he said, Oh, for the love of God, please send me something. This guy's driving me nuts. And that's how it started. My very first book, uh, was from Blackstone Audio. I did Cabbages and Kings by O. Henry. You always remember your first one, and uh, that was the start of it. And I started, um, I started recording at his uh, his place there. He had some booths set up that you could rent time for, and that was the beginning of it. That was the very first, the very first audio book back in 1996. Now that's an impressive story for a lot of different <laughs> reasons. Persistence pays off, yeah, and annoys <laughs> Grover in the process. Um, yes. <laughs> but so you are now really known for your work in nonfiction. That's right. How did that come about? Um, it, by accident, actually. Um, once I started narrating, I realized very quickly that I was – there was a lot – there was so much I didn't know about audiobooks. I had really gotten into it in my mind as a performer just as one more venue to work in. I, you know, uh, and still in 96, audiobooks were still – they were just starting to really take off. And so unlike now in the present day where you have performers who just want to do audiobooks, that's their passion. There, It was – for me as an actor, it was just going to be one more thing I did between theater and movies and television and modeling or whatever. And uh, so – I knew that I needed to narrate as quickly as much material as as I could all the time. It's that you know the ten thousand hour rule that it takes ten thousand hours of deliberate work to sort of master something. And uh, so I called up Blackstone and BOT and I said, "I will narrate anything that nobody else wants." I said, "Do you have like a two volume history of wheat? I'll do it. Give it to me. I don't care." And they took me up on it. And so out of the blue. And I was narrating, you know, B-list titles for them, a lot of stuff. But then out of the blue, Books on Tape sent me this box. Now, this is back in the day when we used to work on tape. And they would mail you a physical copy of the book to narrate. So you would narrate the book, and then you would record it on these big VHS tapes. And then you would FedEx all of that back to the company for them to make their copies of from that master. So this box arrived, this rather large, heavy box and I opened it up, and inside was a five-volume history of the state of California. And each one of those books clocked in at about 30 hours each. And there was a note from Sigrid, the casting director at Books on Tape at the time, and she said, this will keep you quiet. <laughs> so just could, you know, could you, uh, we'll stop you from bothering me for the rest of the year. And sure enough, it did. It took me months and months of work to uh, to finish that but fortunately for me, the books were very well written, and I, it was something I didn't really think about how much I enjoy nonfiction. I didn't, I've enjoyed nonfiction since I was a kid. I would much rather read a book about how they built the pyramids than some mystery you know, with mummies around the pyramids. 
And this goes back to when I was, you know, a grade schooler. And so after I finished that, I began to request, I would say, do you have any more nonfiction lying around? And sure enough, they would send me uh, something here, something there. Um, but I also realized very quickly that doing nonfiction was really difficult. It was even more difficult than the fiction I was doing. There were, the learning curve was steeper. It, you know, I recently put up a little clip on SoundCloud where I talked about the four reasons why nonfiction is more difficult than fiction. And those became apparent to me very, very quickly once I started narrating fiction. I mean, nonfiction, rather. I was going to ask you about that because I watched the clip in preparation for that. Could you kind of go over briefly the four reasons? Yeah. Um, so it starts really with the notion that uh, the purpose of an audiobook, its main purpose is always to be entertaining no matter what. And that's really easy when you think about fiction because a piece of written fiction, it's designed to be entertaining, right? And so in order to do that, the the author has all these storytelling tools that they use to tell their story in fiction that they get passed down to the narrator. Now, I'm not saying that fiction's easy. Don't get me wrong. Fiction's difficult. You have accents and dialogue and narrative voice and, you know, there's a lot of challenges in fiction. But at least you have all these tools and a clear idea about what you're supposed to do as a storyteller. But when you go to nonfiction, you encounter these four really big challenges that most – that trip up most narrators. The first issue you run into is the fact that a piece of written nonfiction is designed to be educational or informative. That's its job. Whether or not it's entertaining is sometimes superfluous. You know, I did a book um, a while back. I did Agile Project Management for Dummies. <laughs> and, uh, uh, you know, it was designed to teach you Agile Project Management straight up and down. That was, you know, it was an educational book. You know, if I, if, if you worked for me at a corporation and, and I was teaching you how to be a manager and I said, here, read this book, Casey, you know, uh, this is how we deal with our direct report. So learn it and then apply it. And then a month later, I came back to you and said, okay, Casey, I gave you that book. How's it working out? You, and you'd say, oh, I learned so much. I've been able to apply it immediately. It's really a great concept. And I'd say, wonderful. So you found the book educational? And you'd say, yeah. And then if I said, did you find the book entertaining? You'd laugh in my face, right? <laughs> You're like, this is, you know, no, it was just facts and figures and concepts. And that's the first issue is that you run into is that you have to realize you have to repurpose the nonfiction book. It has to be entertaining first, right? Or the listener will not stick around to finish the book or they'll just zone it out. So it's that's the first issue you run into is this notion of repurposing the book to make it entertaining, whether it's something that might be f a fun piece of nonfiction about sociology or politics or whatever or something really dense like – Agile Project Management for Dummies. But even if you understand you have to repurpose the book, the next challenge you run into is one of uh, storytelling tools. Because like over in fiction, with all the things you get to work on with fiction, you know, you have dialogue and characters and, and character voices and plot and plot twists. It's like you have a bag of tools to work with, like, you know, 40 tools. But in nonfiction – the number of tools you have to work with shrinks dramatically. You go from 40 down to four because all you have to work with in nonfiction is the writer's voice giving you their intellectual argument in a logical progression to illuminate their truth. And that's it. That's all you've got to – it's like uh, if I were to ask you to build a house. If I said, okay, see, build me a house, but you can choose any tools you want to, to build a house with. Great. You can – Go at it. But if I said, Casey, you have to build me the house, but you only get 10 tools to work with. Now you really have to know how to use those tools really, really well. And so you just have fewer storytelling tools to work with. You know, and even if the narrator understands that idea, that they've got to sort of go narrow and deep with their skills, they hit the third challenge, which is that you're going to run into problems almost immediately with uh, um, the fact that. When you tell a narrator, hey, you're going to be doing some nonfiction for us, what a lot of them hear is, hey, you're going to be doing some non-acting for us. A lot of narrators think that they, there is no acting in nonfiction, that it's just facts and figures, right? And nothing could be further from the truth. Now, the concept, the concept of the, the acting concept or principle behind nonfiction is pretty straightforward, but it's still there. And, but if you don't even realize that that's part of the pr presentation, 
then you're not going to approach it as a, from a from a new a more complex level of performance. You know, the, in the industry, we always talk about having the conversational read in nonfiction, and that implies three things. It implies who are you, who is this person or peop, a group of people you're talking to, and under what circumstances, where are you talking to those people? But most narrators never really sort of conceptualize that idea. They just they're just going to read the, the text on the page. And then the last problem, the final issue with nonfiction, is one of stamina. You know, if you chart the rise and fall of tension um, and excitement, as it were, in a piece of fiction, it sort of has these little peaks and valleys where the the peak comes up to like 10 percent, then goes back down. The next time it goes up to 20 percent and back down to 30, then 40, and so on. So after a, a chapter that's high drama, you have a ne- the next chapter is sort of a relaxed, quieter chapter so that the listener and the reader can sort of go, whoo, okay, they escaped the bad guys. Now what? But in nonfiction, that never happens. Once the forward or the introduction is done, the tone and energy and attitude of the piece in nonfiction is set by the author's uh, personality and their voice, and it maintains that chapter after chapter after chapter. And it's it's exhausting, you know. And if you don't have enough stamina or you don't take enough breaks in between chapters, you, it'll wear you out. And as a result of all those four issues, that's why a lot of nonfiction is just not entertaining, because the it, it it wears the narrator out. It's a flat read. It's not really connected to the material. And so when you put all those together, to me, that's why nonfiction is much more difficult to approach than fiction. When I was listening to you described that on your SoundCloud video, and you got to stamina, and you talked about peaks and valleys. One thing I thought about for me was listening to biographies where uh, certain parts might be more "quote unquote" interesting to someone than other parts. Where, for instance, if you're listening to a a biography of a baseball player, you might be listening more for his career as a baseball player than for his childhood Mm -hmm. so you're not gonna peak and valley like that you're gonna start off slow and then when he gets to the majors you're gonna be more interested in and things like that but Mm -hmm. um i just thought that you had some really good points in that video as far as that went and another article that i read uh, dovetails nicely into my next topic, which is preparing a nonfiction audiobook for recording. And you talked about having three steps, the macro, middle, and micro approaches. So can you kind of go into that a little bit? Oh, sure. Absolutely. Uh, I developed this system because uh, I record a book a week. Uh, I do 50 books a year, and I don't have time to read them before I start. I just don't. I, I skim the material. I look at it um, to get a feel for it. It's like my friend uh, Michael Kramer, who's a really wonderful, amazing narrator. We were talking about this once uh, over dinner. And, um, you know, after a while, once you start narrating for years and years and years, you pick up a book and it's like reading a piece of music. Uh, for instance, I have a friend, uh, Jerry Dale McFadden, who's a keyboardist uh, with a band called The Mavericks. And Jerry's been playing music for uh, 40, 45 years. And um, if you put a piece of music in front of Jerry without knowing anything, and he just started in, he would go, oh, okay, it's in the key of C. It's in 4-4 four, four time. No, it's in cut time. Okay, great. All right. Oh, this is a piece of jazz. Oh, it's rag time. Oh, it's Scott Joplin. Boom. And he's he's off and running. And he figured that all out in the first, you know, eight bars. Suddenly it just took off. And over time, when you narrate enough books, you get a feel for the book almost immediately, you know, um, about the tone and the style and the direction that the, 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 the author is going to take you in. And 90% of the time, it, it goes exactly the way you know. But that comes from years of work. So when I get a book, I, I look it over. And I do this three-step method that helps me get ready to to work on the book and decide how much res- you know how far in I have to prepare before I get started. Um, but the first step of the three, and I use it for every single nonfiction book I work on, and I teach it to my students. And uh, the first step is really I'm sort of thinking like a publisher. 
So I have my publisher's hat on. And here I'm looking at the book in its biggest sense. Like what is what is the book's purpose? Who is the audience? What is the book meant to do and who the author is? So I always start with the author. I I find them on Twitter and follow them on Facebook and I look at their website and maybe they're on YouTube being interviewed. And so I get a feel for who that person is. Um, I also do some background research. What are their bona fides? What gives them the right to say I can write a book on this topic? Um, I think about the audience as a publisher because, uh, you know, every book has one main audience they're trying to hit. And it's important to know that because that's knowing your audience specifically is really important. When I narrate a book, I never, I, I don't narrate the book for, you know, the dad on the subway going to work or the mom you know, going to driving, you know, on the highway or whatever. I narrate for the target audience of the book. It's important for me to know who that is and figure it out. I also look at what is the genre of the book. You know, uh, genres are important uh, because that also might affect the way I approach the book as a narrator. Because some sometimes I have to alter the way I, I actually do the read itself. I have to to um you know if i'm doing a piece of a mystery has a different tone and a different style than say um a self help book as it were or 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 a book about you know some serious topic might be different from sort of a hey let's uh, here's how to you know get your life together and clean your house in five easy steps or whatever i also look at what uh, when when is a book written and when where does it take place you know i i did a book recently called the doctrine and ritual of high magic by elias levy it was written in 1855, and the way they wrote and spoke was radically different from the way we write and speak today. So you have to be conscious of that. Where And when, where a book takes place is important. If I'm doing a history of uh, – let's say I'm doing a history of Chicago, the city, then I'm probably going to give myself a slight Chicago accent when I do the book so it la- lends a little more flavor to the read. And then the last thing I think of at that, that first level as the producer or the publisher is uh, – What's the topic being explored? And what's nice about nonfiction is they always give it away in the subtitle. You know, you want to know what the big meta idea is in the book. Um, and that leads into the second step, which is where I sort of uh, then put on my director's hat and I decide how I'm going to perform the book. So I go to the table of contents and I look at the, I read the table of contents very carefully because if you, by doing so, I can get a feel for where the author is going to take us on a journey by reading the chapters. And you know, I can see, oh, we're going to explore this topic, and then we're going to go over here and talk about this and so on. And then there's always um, uh, you know, basic research like foreign words and phrases and people and how do you say that chemical formula? What's this acronym? And, and then you have to deal with sometimes things like tables and charts and illustrations and usually I, you don't – as a, in nonfiction, you don't describe those things. You just notate it on the, for the publisher and you say, OK, on these pages, you need to make a downloadable PDF companion that goes with it so the person can see you know, the comparative GDPs of Canada, Mexico, and the United States uh, in one chart because it's too complex to describe. But that being said, and this is a really important distinction, we change text in nonfiction all the time. We tweak it all the time. So sometimes you'll encounter a chart or a table or an, a survey that's so simple, you can just describe it. So you are, in effect, change, you're adding language. Or if you, if you hit an acronym, you should always explain what the acronym means because you can't assume the listener knows that NATO means the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. Other thing, little things like you, know, you don't say in the quote above, you say in the previous quote. And that's that's the one of the, the fundamental differences between nonfiction and fiction. It's about changing the text and owning that director's hat. What I teach my students is before I make a change, any change with the text, I ask myself two questions. The first question is, will this change enhance the listener's comprehension? And the answer has to be yes. And the second question is, will it maintain the author's intention? And the answer has to be yes. And then if I can say yes to both of those questions, I'll exercise my prerogative as the director and make the change right then. I won't consult the author or the publisher. They trust me. I mean, that's one of the hats I have to wear. So if they come back later and say, oh, we wanted to change it back to this, then that's fine. I mean, ultimately, they're writing the check for the project. But they can't be bothered for every single little thing. 
you know. And then finally, we have things like you know appendix and footnotes. Do you record those or not? And usually, once again, I don't record them unless I think the appendix. You know, if the author's been going on and on about how cool Appendix A is with all the information, and I look at it, and I go, you know what, this this appendix is actually really good. I will include it. But Appendix B, I'll decide to leave out because it's like a long rambling interview with somebody who's a thought leader, but it doesn't really add all that to the to the book itself. And the, that, you know, to me, if it was that important, they should have included it in the original text and not the appendix. And then footnotes. Uh, footnotes I call Harry Potter candy. You know, in the fir- her first Harry Potter movie, uh, they had those mystery candies. You know, where you they all look the same, so you have to eat it to, to find out the flavor. So sometimes it's like you know cinnamon sparkled unicorn whatever, and then another time it's booger flavored or something. So if the footnote is really interesting, I'll weave it in to the text around the asterisk, you know, where it's supposed to go. And if it's not, I'll just leave it out. Once again, I'm. I'm exercising my prerogative as the director. The last step in my process when I'm looking at the text is uh, is, is sort of – I'm going down to parse the minutia of the writing to try to find the writer's voice. So I start with simple things like how is the text laid out on the page? You know, are there are, – if, if you have a, a book that's got nice, big, blocky paragraphs, but then suddenly there's a really short, tiny paragraph, well, obviously – that's a really important paragraph because it is so small. Visually, it stands out. Or if the author uses italics or underlining or bold, they're sending a visual message to the reader. So now I have to incorporate that into my performance. And then I look for the tone and the style. That's like reading music. You know, What kind of flavor, what kind of style is this piece of music in, as it were? What point of view is the piece in? Is it in first, second, or third? I also look at the language. You know, writing is like acting. It's about choices. So how uh, an author uses – decides to describe something is important, the language they use, and I need to be aware of that. Uh, then there's punctuation. You know, if, if everything is sort of normal with periods and semicolons and, you know, it's all very pedestrian. But what happens when you run into somebody like Herman Melville or David Foster Wallace who are the kings of the semicolon and the run-on sentence? And that implies something about tempo and style. The really the last thing that I look for, is especially nonfiction, is it's what I call the secret sauce of nonfiction, is sense of humor. And I don't mean it in its pedestrian sense. I mean it in a little more complicated way. It starts with the the author deciding, you know, in nonfiction, an author says, "I'm going to tell you about a, this thing, whatever that might be, like Wall Street investing or PTSD or, you know." Uh, whatever. And that's one thing. But then if they decide, I'm going to tell you how I feel about the thing I'm describing, that means they're putting their personality into the piece, which most nonfiction writers do. And part of their personality, of course, is their sense of humor. And so the next step after that is their ability to write their personality and sense of humor into the piece itself. And that's a a writing skill. But then it gets passed down to me, the narrator, and i I tell my students that they have to develop this little antenna that sticks out of their head. So then they read a certain sentence. They go, oh, uh, the way this, you know, if I say this sentence in a certain way, I sense the potential for humor. They're trying to be funny. Then to figure out what kind of humor it is, how best to execute it. And then the last bit, of course, is to, as a performer, to land the joke, to make, to bring the humor that's appropriate to the sentence to light for the listener. Because if I can get you to smile, and if I can get you to laugh in a piece of nonfiction, I've got you hooked. You're going to stick around. I use this method to quickly go through the material, and I've done it for years and years, so it's very succinct. And that allows me to really get a feel for the book uh, and uh, without having to have read every single page. That is quite the method. And while you were talking about it, I was reminded of a couple different stories. One about acronyms, which is when I was in high school, I was on the debate team. And when I was a sophomore, it was my first full year. And the coach said to us in class one day that he needed people to serve on the NFL committee. And I'm thinking, football. What, what are you? What are you? What? What's the connection between uh, football and uh, debate? And then he says, and before anybody 
asks any questions. In this case, NFL means National Forensics League. And I was like, oh, okay, I get it now. So there was a, a potential embarrassment avoided on my part by him explaining which NFL he was talking about because I didn't know there was more than one at the time. Sure. Yeah, it's you have to know that. And and so you would you would insert the phrase like you would say, you know, NFL, an acronym for National Forensics League. And now they know. And so when you come back to it again, you can just say NFL. And the same goes for abbreviations. This is a thing that it drives me nuts when I hear a narrator you know, they they actually say the abbreviation. In other words, if they see R E colon, they'll say re or ray, but that's not what it is. It's regarding. An abbreviation is a printer's shortcut. It's used for crowding text on the page. It's not meant to be you know, we don't say etka for et cetera. And we don't say DR period Johnson for Dr. Johnson. Right? And so when I and sometimes you you know also have symbols. Like, you know, you might have the astrological symbol for Neptune or Gemini, and you you have to say what that symbol is, you know, and that's – that's once again, that's one of those many things that about – that's nonfiction that that makes it uh, so unique and challenging. Uh, numbers are another issue, like in citations. Like if your numbers always have to have context. So if I'm – if I quote something from Shakespeare, and if at the end of it I said, Hamlet 5-3 – the listener might think, wait, is Hamlet five foot three inches tall? No, it comes from Hamlet Act Five, Scene Three. And that's why you also say things like Genesis chapter two, verse four. You always say chapter and verse, because don't assume the listener knows that if you said Genesis, you know, two four, they're gonna know what that means. So you these are all little tiny tricks you learn over time as a director of yourself when you're working in or you know, you get feedback or or you're listening to somebody else do a book. You know, I, I, I'm always writing my students about listening to nonfiction all the time because they're going to start to pick out these little moments where, hey, wait, that's confusing. What did they mean by that? And then, you you know, you learn from the good examples and, and the bad examples as well. Going back to uh, the fact that you narrate 50 books a year, that's uh, really impressive. And you talked about how you uh, managed to do that. But tell the listeners a little bit about what the what a day in the life of Sean Pratt is like in terms of your projects and working on a book. Well, I also coach because that figures into my day. I, I, I coach nonfiction narration technique, and that's part of my day. So um, – it's my day starts um, six six thirty when I get up and I'm having coffee and I'm actually reviewing my students' material for the day. I usually see one or two s- students a day, so I'm listening to their their audio assignments and uh, reviewing other mat- of homework that I give them. Um, and then when I'm eating breakfast, uh, I'm also and this is part of being a narrator. I'm deciding what. Uh, information I want to share on social media about my career, what I'm working on, on Twitter and Facebook. Um, so that's that's integral as part of my career, just as much as narrating a book. So I'm thinking, okay, well, do I want to talk about a review I got on a book, or do I want to share the first five minutes of a, you know, something I've recorded? Or but you have to may have a presence uh, on social media so people will know what you're up to. And then um, I take a little bit of time. To physically warm up, do some yoga, stretch my face out, warm up my voice, and then I, I go through and I know how many pages more or less I'll be narrating throughout the day, or at least that morning session. So I'll skim through those those pages to make sure there's no surprises that I, I've got everything, and I'll make any notes I want, and take a look at that. You know, uh, oh, there's a you know a chart on page 46. I have to you know, so I'll put it on the list or whatever. And then I try to get into the booth around 8:30. Maybe sometimes nine. My booth is uh, well. It's it's really in the corner of a room. Uh, it's custom. I've I've built, with the exception of one instance, I've always built my own my own booths. And being a carpenter, I could do that. But this one's in the corner of a room, and there's a big heavy drape around the back side. So, if you were to look at it from the top, it looks like a big pie wedge, because I'm facing into the corner of of the wall, and the big curtain comes in behind me. I fire up my Studio One software, and I get settled with my iPad, and uh, turn off my phone, you know, so I don't have any distractions. And then uh, 
I usually start off by listening to the last five to ten minutes of what I did yesterday, if I'm continuing in that same chapter, so I can roll into it at the right tempo. And then I'm off and running. And I record using a style of editing called punch and roll recording, where you uh, you're editing in real time, just like you would in the old days of tape, where you know the tape you'd be recording on the tape until you screwed up and you'd hit stop. You re- rewind the tape momentarily. Listen to yourself, and then before the mistake, you hit record or punch into the recording and then roll forward over the mistake. But I do that electronically now using my mouse and keyboard. And so I, for the next hour and a half, I will focus and record. And usually in 90 minutes, I can get about 60 minutes of material recorded. Um, and now it's ready to be sent off to the proofer. So if there's any mistakes, they'll give me a list of those later for me to do corrections with. So I usually record till about 10.30, 10.45, and then I stop and go off and run errands, go to the gym, you know, just get out of the house. It's it's It can be a rather claustrophobic life. I mean, I, I think I tell people all the time that I have friends who are really wonderful performers who express an interest into getting into audiobooks. And it turns out it's not the talent that's the deciding factor of whether or not they can do it. It's their temperament. Do you have the temperament to sit in a little tiny space all by yourself and work hour after hour with no one there to guide you? You know, it's so you deal with claustrophobia or just, you know, interaction with people. And I'm fine for that. I'm, I'm a homebody. I like working by myself and I like being by myself when I work and, uh, in my house and so I go off to the gym and do this and that but the one thing I don't do is speak I let my voice rest then I get back and grab some lunch and at 12.30 12.45 I have my first student and then I teach one or two students a day and then around 3 o'clock I'm finished and then I <laughs> I crash and burn I go take a nap <laughs> I'm tired I'm mentally tired and vocally tired it takes a lot of Mental focus to to narrate nonfiction, and then of course to teach as well. I'm sure your listeners who've done any teaching uh, can testify to that. But then I get up, have a cup of coffee, sort of wake myself up physically again, and while I'm doing that, I'm looking over the next several pages I'll be narrating that afternoon. And around oh, I'd say four thirty, five o'clock, I'm back in the booth until six thirty-seven, narrating my second chunk. So. All in all, uh, the goal is to get between 100 and 120 minutes finished a day. And by the end of the day, I, I'm just – I'm toast. <laughs> I, all I want to do is have a bourbon and watch cartoons. <laughs> That's about all I can handle at the end of the day. Well, that sounds like a pretty fun end of the day to me as far as that goes. <laughs> So I've heard you talk about taking care of your voice uh, several times as I was preparing for this interview, and you talked about not speaking while you're running errands and things just a moment ago. What are some of the other things you do to take care of your voice or don't do to burn it out? Well, I I never shout. (laughs) So, uh, you know, if I go to a sporting event or something, I may be, you know, clapping my hands, but I'm not screaming and yelling. That's for sure. Because then yeah, I'll ruin my voice for several days. I never record when I'm sick because I can't get a vocal match. I drink a lot of tea. I brew a special tea. Up. I use throat coat tea, and then I add a flavor to it like lemon zinger or peppermint or something. Uh, but I go through probably – I probably drink half to three-quarters of a gallon of water a day. I also keep Ricolas handy in case I need them while I'm teaching if my voice starts to sound tired. Of course, I don't smoke, and I warm my voice up. You know, I, I don't. I'm not trying to do anything like an opera warm up, but I do vocalize in the morning, just to sort of get everything, you know, sort of warmed up and humming along. And then uh, posture is important too. I have a, I spent some, you know, I have a good, really pricey little chair that I sit in that keeps my posture straight up and down. In the winter time. I always have humidifiers going throughout the house to keep uh, so it doesn't dry up my uh, sinuses and so on. And that's about it, really. I just, you know, I, I've learned the hard way that, and also I, I do have a limit to how much I can record in a day, how much I'll actually speak. Between narrating and teaching, there's a certain, 
you know, it gets to a certain place where I'm like, I can feel my voice starting to go. And, you know, usually that's, that coincides with hitting my daily goals. Uh, as a narrator, you know, I always say that narrating an audiobook is like eating an elephant. You do it one forkful at a time. It's the same deal. You can't, you can't spend eight, 10 hours in the studio talking and expect to have a voice the next day. It's just impossible. So stamina in that, in that way is important too. So you talked a little bit about your booth and I know you've shared, uh, YouTube videos on the inside of an, uh, audiobook narration booth uh and you've sort of talked about the positioning of your booth but Mm -hmm. for listeners who might not have any idea could you kind of go through what the inside of your booth is like sure um they can also watch the video on youtube if they look me up and then the name of the video is called inside the narrator's booth and that was a booth i had oh gosh about 10 years ago the first thing that is important about the booth is that it be laid out ergonomically. You know, a lot of my students, when they first start, they just grab a table and they're staring at a laptop and they just sort of slap the different bits, you know, the microphone and those things. There's not a lot of thought given to where are they placed and everything needs to be fine tuned to your particular size. Because if you're constantly having to turn your neck in a funny way to look at your screen or check, you know, do this or that, over time, it's going to actually have a, you know, you're going to get a, a crick in your neck or your shoulder is going to hurt or something. So it starts off with the chair. I always teach them when they're building their studio to start with a chair that they're going to be sitting on or an exercise ball or a stool or whatever. And then if they can to place the keyboard height uh, properly, that it's not too high and it's not too low. So they might have to raise or lower their, their table. And that goes with the mouse, of course, is right next to it. And then, um, I have a secondary shelf in my studio, and on that shelf sits the bookstand that my iPad sits on, and then over to the left-hand side is the flat screen that shows me the computer, because my computer is a little Mac Mini that sits below underneath where I narrate. And those two screens, the iPad and the flat screen, are at my eye level, so I just have to swivel my head back and forth, and I don't have to dip it or turn it in an odd way. And then, of course, the microphone, where you place the microphone is also important. Uh, I tend to tell my students to – my microphone is actually upside down. It's on an arm stand, but it comes in from the upper left-hand side of my – to my face. So it's sort of over my right eye in a way, slightly off-center. It's not in front of my mouth. It's just to the side. So I actually speak past the microphone, not into the microphone. And that helps eliminate plosives and fricatives and – Weird, you know, pops and so on. And then, of course, you know, if I have any other materials I need, like where I keep my charts and dictionaries and things, but those are all within easy reach. So the idea is that once I'm sat in position, everything has been customized just for me. So all I have to do is swivel my head side to side or up and down, and that's it. And so I can maintain good posture during the whole time. It's interesting because, of course, doing this for so long, uh, you've seen a lot of technological changes come about. I mean, obviously, Mm -hmm. 20 years ago, there were no iPads uh, to be reading (laughs) uh, books off of. I I went 21 years ago. I was a sophomore in high school, Mm -hmm. and if we wanted to use the Internet, we had to go to the Internet Lab. It was the only room in the school that had Internet access. And data tells me, Sean, that I need to explain this to some of my listeners because they're uh, 25 or younger and don't know what that life was like, you know, and, and I have not even reached the point where I've had full-time access to the internet for half of my life yet. So what are some of the, uh, you've talked about a few of them. What are some of the other technological things that are different now than they used to be when you started? Well, the first one was of course, the, the system you recorded on, we recorded on VHS tape in a system called ADAT, um, audio digital, um, something analog recording or whatever it was tape. And, um, So you would – each VHS tape had a total of – I think it was uh, eight different tracks on it, which is a chemical emulsion that's on the the tape itself. And so you could record four cassettes on it, 
So that's A side and B side for four cassettes. And so you would, um, you know, you'd put the tape in the machine initially and you had to let it run through all by itself one time and it would lay down a time code on the tape itself. So you could find where you were in the tape. There was no other way to do it. You know, so you, you ran through once, put the time code down, then you would rewind it to zero, select which track you wanted to be in manually, one, two, one through eight. And then you would start recording. And then, of course, like you said, there were no iPads. So I get this question a lot. People say, well, how do you, how do you turn the pages in the book so quietly? And I'm like, you don't. <laughs> you, you record till you get to the bottom of the page, and then you'd stop. And then you'd memorize the la- that, that first part of that sentence on the page you had in front of you, and then the other part of the sentence on the back side. And you would record that sentence in isolation. And then you'd turn, stop again, turn, the page, lock everything down, and then start recording that next, you know, two pages until you get to the bottom of the next page, and you did that page after page after page, and so you know, there's never you, you never tried to turn the page quietly because you you never could do it. You would always hear that shh sound as you turn the page or the crinkle. So there was that. The quality of the recordings between analog and digital is huge. You know, the digital is so unforgiving. And that's why, you know, when I went digital in 2000, uh, you know, I, I had a good sound engineer come in and, and sort of, he sort of like dampened the quality of the sound down slightly because it was so crisp. You could hear everything. So that was a, that was a big deal as well. Also in the old days, depending on the client, we used to, we used to make dubs from the master VHS onto high quality cassette tapes. And that's what they made. Th- those cassette tapes are what they made uh, r- copies of that you heard is in you know when you checked it out of the library on cassette. So it went from cassette, and then out of that they turned them in. Once it went digital, of course, it went DVD or CD rather, and um, and then finally we had digital downloads. It's funny to think back now about all those those books that I did that were on physical tape. Um, you know, I've done. Like I said, 930 books now. There's about 300 books you can't find of mine anymore. 200 of them belong to a company in Albuquerque called uh, Americana Publishing, and I did westerns and science fiction. I did four books a month for them. They were short. They were like six hours long, like westerns and sci-fi, and they were a lot of fun to do. And then after I'd done about 200 titles, one day they just went bankrupt. Boom. And so all those tapes – they're sitting in a warehouse somewhere in Albuquerque for the last 20 years or whatever. And then there's another hundred titles of mine that have disappeared, either because they were really early uh, recordings with small companies that have also gone out of business. Uh, they were early recordings on tape that have never been digitized. Or finally, there are books I've done privately that were not for public sale. Like, you know, uh, for instance, I did a book last year. For a guy, he's a real estate guru, and he sells his, you know, his coaching plan to make a million dollars in Wall Street. These four books, they're not for sale anywhere but through him at his workshops, so they'll never be up on Audible. So there's there's about 300 titles that have just gone, but a lot of them were those old old tape titles that have just uh, you know disappeared into the ether. And I wanted to ask you this because when I listen to nonfiction, which is quite regularly, um, for a lot of the same reasons that you said that you found it uh, appealing, because I, I want to know how the pyramids were made, you know, things like things like that. But I was wondering, do you ever get people who come up to you and say, like, oh, you read this book? say something to the effect they they don't know that it was a job and think it was an endorsement you know what i mean like uh it, for instance if it's a political book like oh this is it's because you read it you're endorsing these uh beliefs do you ever get anything like that on occasion it's very rare because also because oftentimes you know i I could probably count on my hands the number of books I've turned down over the years. The majority of the time I turn a book down, it's because of scheduling. But every so often, I'll come across a book that I don't agree with personally, and so I just won't do it. So for that very reason, it's like a personal thing. You know, Ultimately, I have to decide whether or not I want to do a certain genre or a certain topic or a certain author. More often than not, when people find out I do audiobooks, 
they're either totally wowed by it or they go, well, you're just reading a book, right? <laughs> you know, and, and my response, you know, when I get the wow, I'm like, hey, thank you very much. I, I really appreciate you that you understand what we do is special. It's a lot of fun, and but it is a challenge. And when I get people who dismiss what I do, like, well, you're just reading the book, right, out loud. And that's when I always, you know, I get – when my Buddha nature is not at its finest, I might say uh, – I might say, well, yeah, you should do you should do it then. You know, if you if you think it's so easy, because Lord knows I make more money than you do, so you know, give it a shot. See how easy it is. You know, uh, I always love it on those uh, comment threads when you have authors who decide they want to narrate their own piece, and they come back and say, oh my God, what did it, what, what was I thinking? That was the most difficult thing I've ever done in my entire life. You know, uh, just because someone wrote writing a book and narrating a book are two totally different skills and disciplines. And they are, and they are by and large mutually exclusive. And a lot of authors and listeners don't understand that. Yeah, I would hope people listening this far into the interview would have reached the conclusion that you are doing a little bit more than just reading a book at this <laughs> uh, particular stage. Having done 930 of them, and we sort of talked about uh, one thing off the air a little bit before we started. Mm -hmm. uh, what are the things, some of the things that kind of even now sort of trip you up a little bit? Oh, yeah. Uh, well, I was saying to you earlier that uh, my least favorite genre to narrate are sports books. And uh, it's not because of the sport itself or the – I mean I like I like the story of an athlete who overcomes adversity to triumph. You know, and, and, and I think that's a great – it's a really compelling human drama. It's not that. It's when you do a book about an international sport like soccer or golf or baseball, and it, it has to do with the pronunciation of the athletes' names and the, those, the fans of that athlete. So, for instance, I did a book for Tantor Media uh, a couple of years ago called Slaying the Tiger by Shane Ryan. Excellent book. Uh, it's about the two, 2014 Masters uh, tournaments uh, in the United States and all these young golfers coming up trying to take Tiger Woods' mantle as the greatest golfer you know, uh, from him, hence the title of the book. And so you have all these golfers and they're from all over the world. So for instance, there's one golfer who's French and in his home country of France, if you pronounced his last name, it would be Dubisson with that Gallic N that's up in your nose, that all sound. Well, in the United States, sportscasters either say his name Dubison with a hard N or Dubison on the first syllable. Well, now you have a problem because you've got three different ways you can say this guy's the name and you have to pick one and be consistent. Okay, So you, in the act of picking one, you also realize that there are going to be fans of this golfer who are going to hear this book and flip out because you, quote, mispronounced his name. And then they will leave you these terrible reviews on Audible. And it's happened with every single sports book I've ever done when you have international athletes. Uh, I, when I got the book from Tantor, I, I, I remember calling them up and I said, you understand what's going to happen, right? That this is going to happen. I'm going to get reviews like this. And they said, yes, we do. We understand. And sure enough, if you look up uh, that book, uh, it's a really wonderful book to listen to. About every, I don't know, six or eighth review, so they like, well, he mispronounced all these names, and I didn't mispronounce them. I, you know, laboriously researched every single one of them. But you have to make a decision. It's almost like a tomato tomato kind of thing, and people lose, especially sports fans, they lose their minds over stuff like this. And uh, it's a no-win situation. Yeah, I can say that when I listen to a book and I hear a mispronunciation, I am jolted right out of it, at least temporarily. Yeah. You know, yeah. I saw on social media this week that uh, you had a, a publisher send you a, an email that allegedly – came from a listener that said you had mispronounced mispronounced a bunch of things that you didn't. Yes. Yeah, uh, it was a specific – the publisher passed this email on to me without any comment. They just sent it to me, and it was a listener, and it's – if I can dissect it, her last name, by looking at her last name, you could tell that she was from Eastern Europe. Okay, She might be Polish. She might be German or Czechoslovakian, but she's from uh, that – 
area of the world. And so the book in question was by an American writer named Tony Judd, and his last name is spelled J-U-D-T. Well, in German, you would pronounce it Jud, right? The J is a Y sound. And then she also referenced a certain area uh, of Eastern Europe. I forgot. I think it's Ruthenia. And she said, I mispronounced that over and over again. Well, if you're from that part of the world, they pronounce it differently, right? But when you have foreign language or foreign words, people and places, and the focus of the book is with an American narrator and an American author, we anglicize the pronunciation. And you run into this issue all the time in audiobooks. I did a three-volume history by Richard Evans of the rise and fall of Nazi Germany. And so, you know, how German do you want to sound when you're pronouncing these German names, even though the book is written for an American audience? It's not written for a German audience. So you have to anglicize. You know, what I teach my students is how would a newscaster from Illinois say this name or this phrase, right? And so once again, you run into this. How much do you sound like a native speaker when you say something? And other times you just, you know, like I said, you you get a, an email like this where they swear up and down you've pronounced pronounced it, but you go back and you go, no, I'm right, they're wrong, they're, you know, th- they've made a mistake in their own, either they don't know how to pronounce the word or they're thinking of it being pronounced like a native speaker. And so the the part that upset me was not necessarily the woman's email, but that the publisher would send me this this response they got and it i was upset because it felt like okay you you know we know you've done 930 books and you've recorded for 21 years but uh, we're going to take this woman whom we don't know at all her word about that you've made a mistake and uh, we're going to go with her and, and challenge you on this book and that that's the part that upset me one thing that i came across was what you call the test and on YouTube, if you uh, go and look it up, it's called So You Want to Be an Audiobook Narrator. I thought that was really fascinating. And could you kind of give the listeners a little bit of, of a taste of what the test is? Uh, sure. You know, I, I, I constantly get emails every week. I, I get half a dozen emails a week from people all over the world, literally. I love audiobooks. People tell me I have a great voice or, you know, I come from a different kind of VO. Um, and I really like to get into this. I have a standard response. I send them saying, OK, uh, here's what you should do. And the first thing is to take the test, as I call it. And so the test is pick a book off the shelf you like. I say I usually say maybe something nonfiction, just something easy to read, you know, a book you like. And then you're going to want to set up a table and chair somewhere in a confined space, a closet, an alcove or whatever, and leave it there. Um, and if you don't have a space like that, then face the table into the corner of the room. Put the book up on a, a music stand or a book stand. You don't want to hold it. And then try to elevate the book so it's more or less at eye level. Uh, shine a light on the book. Turn the lights off around you. And then sit down and read out loud for two to three hours a day. Now, you can take breaks in between. It's not like a constant two to three hours of narration. So you record maybe for – or not even record. You're just reading out loud. There's no equipment needed for the test. So you, know, you record, uh, narrate for 30 minutes and take a five-minute break and then go back and do it again and then take a break and do it again and take a break and so on. And you, you're not allowed to just sort of mumble your way through the book. You need to feel like you're reading it to someone, an audience or a person. If you make a mistake, if you stumble in the middle of a sentence, you have to stop and start the sentence again. If you hit a word that you don't know how to pronounce, you have to stop and go look it up. You're not allowed to guess. And I say, narrate, do that two to three hours a day for 14 days. And that will tell you quicker than anything else whether or not you have the temperament to be an audiobook narrator. And what's really amazing to me is I'll get people on, you know, in the comment thread of the YouTube channel. Uh, my YouTube channel where that video is posted or privately they'll send me emails. Sometimes they'll say, hey, I passed the test and I'm going to do the other things you suggested in this email. Thank you so much for your time. But then I'll get these emails, which are even better, which they say, I took the test and you have absolutely positively convinced me that I never, ever, ever want to do this for a living. <laughs> and and in a way, it makes me feel good because I've saved them a tremendous amount of time and money and heartache. You know, I think that's one of the things I 
I try to do as a teacher is I always try to tell my students or anybody who comes to me the truth, even if the truth is not very palatable. And in the end, I've, I've never had someone get angry at me for telling them the truth. Like, if you can't do this, you have no business narrating. They, they always come back and thank me because they realize they, they didn't have an understanding of how complicated audiobook narration was. And this is just, you know, skimming the surface. There's so much more once you get into it, but that essential piece of sitting and reading aloud by yourself hour after hour after hour will teach you more about whether or not you want to be a narrator than anything else. Even for me, like the idea of reading out loud, I'm not a very good uh, reader out loud for some reason. And it might be because I have to read Braille and it takes a lot of time for information to get from hand to head to mouth. But uh, I've never been able to read out loud. So like even just starting from there is uh, difficult enough and then adding on top of it uh, doing it over and over and over day after day after day is quite the test yeah it's tough because you know and, and then there's in fiction or nonfiction there's the mental stamina you know then the vocal stamina that comes with it as well i could regale you with story after story of you know directors and engineers who they have to work with a, an author or a celebrity who's never done an audio book struggle through this thing hour after hour, day after day to try to, you know, pull a performance out of them so the book doesn't, you know, isn't terrible. And there's some really famous audiobooks out there with celebrities and authors that are notoriously terrible because of this reason. They, you know, they, they thought it was going to be easy and they get into it. They're like, oh my God. What happens is for a new narrator is, you know, let's say you're doing nonfiction and it's a, you know, a fairly dense topic. You know, it's something about PTSD or sociology or uh, whatever. And, and you, so you work all day and then you count it. You're like, Oh my God, I've only done 40 pages of this book and this book is 400 pages long or whatever. And what happens is, is they panic inside and they sort of get to this mentality like, well, I just got to get through it as quickly as possible. And that's not the goal of nonfiction or any fiction, any narration, but especially in nonfiction. The goal is not to get through it as quickly as possible. The goal is to entertain the listener. And that's a whole different level of, of, of nuance and skill and, and effort that has to be learned. So if someone passes the test and gets to a point where uh, they can become a student of yours, what are some of the types of things we can delve more into? Uh, in depth into them individually later, but what are some of the topics that you uh, address with your students? Well, to begin with, I normally don't take raw beginners because nonfiction is too difficult, uh, and and also most new narrators want to do fiction anyway. So I recommend them to other coaches. Um, my students tend to be uh, well, they are they're all working narrators, so they've already done a certain number of books anyway. Uh, so they've, you know, they've 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 been broken in, as it were. They understand what's ahead of them. So there's that. But when I'm working with my students, if you haven't figured out by now, I'm I'm a very Type A person, <laughs> very orderly. My mother was a, a secretary and office manager for 50 years, and my my late father was a, he was a fireman. So it's, it was all about planning and execution. And so when I decided to become started to do coaching, I'd done workshops. I did several workshops over the years about audiobooks in the mid-Atlantic region, and I kept getting asked, would you do coaching? And at the time, I was just too busy. But eventually, I sort of got tired of doing workshops all the time and Skype's available, and I said, okay, I'll dip my toe into this. And I realized that I had a lot of concepts I wanted to share as a teacher. And so, in effect, what I've done is I've curricularized what I teach. Unlike with fiction – a lot of times in fiction, it's it's sort of like going to an acting teacher. When I was a theater actor in New York, you know, you would I had an acting teacher. She was my coach, so I would just schedule a time with her, walk in the door with whatever I wanted to work on. Maybe it's an audition, or a monologue, or whatever. And so I would just do it, and she would just work with me, you know, just on the fly. There was no preparation on her part. She just dealt with what was in front of her. And, and I got a lot out of it. That's great. But I realized that for nonfiction, that just wouldn't work. There's too many things, too many nuances in nonfiction for it to be that kind of a session. So I began to develop these concepts that I teach, like the three-step method of research. There's a concept I teach called the four voices of nonfiction. 
where uh, I help them delineate with their performance so they can help the listener understand what it is they're seeing on the text. I talk about things like uh, tempo modulation, how to deal with citations, charts and graphs, you know, uh, a concept known as paragraph colors that a paragraph is a meditation on a single idea. And if you look at the language carefully enough, the author will give you a clue as to how they feel about the idea. And then if they, you know, they, let's say they're talking about topic A and by their language, you realize they're, they're angry about that. Well, then you, you make an acting choice during that paragraph to sound a little angry because that's the, the feeling of the author. But the next paragraph, maybe they're being uh, reflective because the topic switches to a new idea. So I, so I had all these ideas that I wanted to create exercises for. And so I created this curriculum. So I work my students session after session after session. You know, so each time they meet, we build on the last one with a new idea. And then the other thing I work with them on is um, having grown up in show business. You know, it's not enough to be a good performer. You have to understand the business part of show business. So, you know, I, I teach them marketing and networking and advertising. Uh, so they have a feel for that, and I help them create a better websites and materials that they can share and and how to use social media effectively. And then I think the last – well, the last thing that I share with my students over time is really it happens in the interaction. I, it would, And it's my goal as a teacher. I think any good teacher would have, want, and that's – I instill confidence in my students. So by the time they leave me – because they all graduate after – you know, uh, like 12 to four, 12 to 16 sessions over a period of months. Uh, eventually they, they graduate. I say, okay, we're done. Now it's time for you to go off. And my feeling is they have confidence then to, to step forward into their careers with all the information and the experience of working with me. And that confidence, you know, it can't be under, uh, undervalued. It's, it's a really important thing. Well, I just, I just thought it was interesting that, you know, uh, like I said, I listen to a lot of books and I follow a lot of narrators. And when I was going through your social media, I would mark off these titles that you were talking about that I might not have seen otherwise and added them to my wish list. One that I'm very much looking forward to, one that you did recently called The Death of Expertise. Yeah, I probably wouldn't have even known about it if I hadn't been following your uh posts in preparation for the interview, but what I would say to the listeners is that, uh, you know, Sean, you have 900 books out there, and you're still out there every day uh, getting your own name out there and, you know, not resting on any reputation that you might have developed. Could you talk a little bit about some of the marketing things that you teach? Like, I know you talk about newsletters a lot mm -hmm. well it goes back to the stuff i learned as a theater actor you know there's you know the old the old chestnut about if a tree falls in a forest and no one's there does it make a sound and what i say is if a performer does a project and doesn't tell people about it did they really do it and so in this context it's about staying in touch with casting directors publishers, producers, directors, and authors via via email. And uh, what I do is I say, you know, all you need to do is send out once a month, you send out sort of an email blast saying, I did these two to five things, and they're very succinct. They're very, um, very, you know, I did this book. I went to this event. Hey, I have a great review. Hey, here's the first five minutes of this book. And it's very succinct bullet points. It's not elaborate at all because the real the real message it sends is if it comes once a month, it tells the the people who receive it that this you know that this guy or gal has got their act together that they're moving you know they're they're professional about their work and they're working all the time and then of course the implication is hey we should make sure this person stays on our radar and that's the other thing it does because until you know if I send out this email blast to everybody just once a month. For a certain amount of time, I'm going to be in that person's, you know, at the top of their list for what it is my specialty. And then if, if the planets align in the right moment, suddenly you're going to get, a, you know, you'll get an audition or a straight up offer for a book, you know, and I have, I could, I could literally spend an hour or two just giving you anecdote after anecdote of my students doing this. 
and coming back and suddenly they got a book or a series or an audition or you know something happened the day they sent that that email out and it, and, it, and it doesn't have to be overkill like i said it's just once a month i also make my students post on twitter and facebook 3 to 5 times a week so it's once a day you know monday through friday um i the story i'd like to share is I didn't take Twitter very seriously for a long time, and then about four or five years ago, I I decided I had to, you know, I'd done so many, I'd narrated so many books about how to use social media that I said I've got to give these this stuff a try. So I, I began to, so when I would get a new book, the first thing I would do was find the author on Twitter, follow them, send them a message, hey, I'm excited to do your book, find the publisher, do the same thing, and then do a tweet. You know, so now I'm narrating book X by so and so, published by so and so for this audio company. And then they would pick that stuff up and retweet it or like it or whatever. And so I was showing all those people that I was involved in social media and the promotion of the book. But then about, I'm going to say three years ago, I did a book called Real Life MBA by Jack and Susie Welch. And uh, Jack Welch was the CEO of General Electric um, in the 90s and he saved the corporation. Uh, back then, so he's a big time, you know, in the business world. He's he's a you know a guru, and he and his wife have a for-profit MBA program with Strayer University in Virginia, and they also go around the world holding these like you know weekend retreats with motivational speakers for C-suite level people and corporations, right? And so they selected me to do their book. Uh, I think Susie had heard me do a couple of other business books, and I did it. I want to say I did it for Tantor. Not, I can't remember now, but um. So for the 10 days that I worked on the book, I tweeted about it every single day and posted it on Facebook, right? And they picked that up and they retweeted it. Well, Susie has something like like 57,000 followers. Well, Jack Welch has 1.5 million followers. A lot of those people are other nonfiction authors who followed them for business or whatever. I recorded that book like in January of about three years ago. And starting in February, something really weird happened. I started getting contacted privately through Twitter and through email by other authors who wanted me to do their book. These are nonfiction authors for business or, you know, whatever. And I always, I always ask people when they find me, how did you hear about me? And again and again and again, I kept getting, oh, I follow Jack and Susie Welch on Twitter. And I saw that you did their book and I thought maybe you would do mine. And that year, I think I booked a total of 12 or 13 books privately on my own when that was the case. And then on top of that, I had about 10 to 12 books through my regular publishers like Blackstone or Tantor or Random House or so on, where when I spoke with the author, I always said, well, how did you, you know, why did you pick me or, or how would you find me? And they had the same reaction. It was like, oh, I follow so-and-so. And so and so, and also I saw you on Jack and Susie Welch's feed, and I thought I'd like to have you do it. So being out there, that little piece of marketing is so crucial. It's It, it cannot be ignored, and, and sometimes it's like pulling teeth with some of my students because they you know, they look, well, I'm old, and I don't understand Twitter. I'm like, I don't care. If you want to have a career, you have to you know, enter the 21st century, and this is how it's done. I don't want to hear you crying about the fact that you're not finding enough work when you're not doing something that is free and takes five minutes of your day. You know, and I'm I'm proof. I mean, I'm proof positive that it works. And so I teach them, you know, some basic things like that. I teach them networking tricks. We go over all their demos and we do all those things together so that they're ready when the opportunity knocks to be ready to supply an author with a demo or maybe a, a resume of their audiobook work or reviews if they need them and so on. And again and again, they come back to me, my students, and they're like, hey, I landed this series. I landed this thing because so-and-so contacted me or I emailed so-and-so or they saw my Twitter feed. It's it's so, so important. It, it It's 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 absolutely critical. Well, you know, it's interesting because I really appreciate that um, bit of information, and it sort of dovetails with something that I came to realize just recently. But, you know, I have no problem soliciting interviews for this podcast and asking people if they will come on the show. But if someone comes to me and asks me if they can come on the show, they tend to move up the queue. Mm -hmm. 
because I'm now more aware of them and I know that they have an interest in doing it and you know if they have a specific project or just want to talk about their career or whatever it might be you know they are at the forefront of my mind because they made that contact you know just like you were saying about uh, the person reading that newsletter that you sent out mm-hmm. yeah it's all that simple well you know and it's funny you should bring that up because I you know certain students I have have reached a certain level in their career where I encourage them to start looking around for getting interviewed on podcasts or blogs or articles and so on because I tell them, I'm like, those people who run blogs and podcasts, they're always looking for something interesting. And if you come to them with an interesting angle about who you are, your biography as it were, they might say yes, and then now you can, you know, you that's you can't buy that kind of exposure. And you know, ultimately, this is show business. This is the show part of the business, you know. And it's helped raise the profile of many of my students by doing, you know, podcasts. And you know, like it helps. You know, it, it, Andrea M's my student was on your show a couple of weeks ago. It was a really great interview we had with her and the author that she worked with for that book. And you know, uh, that can only be. That can only help her in her career in the long run, and that's what I try to encourage with my students. And by and large, they listen. I'd say, you know, about seventy-five percent follow through, and they start moving forward. And so you'll get, you know, like my students, like James Foster or Joel Joel Frumkin. Those those gentlemen have utilized social media, and it's really beginning to turn their overcharge their, you know, their career. And so the inertia, the momentum, is gaining steam. It's really wonderful to watch. Talking about the things that are wonderful to watch, and you can take this in any direction that you want, but we want to end or, you know, come close to the end on a high note. And so either as a narrator or, you know, a coach, tell the listeners some of the most rewarding things that have happened to you in your career as an audiobook narrator and coach. As a coach, I'm very paternal about my students. I want them to succeed. And so I really, I really push hard. I push them hard so that they will, um, you know, I, if I believe in a student, if, I sh- if they've really shown me over the time, our time together, that they're really serious and they're really pushing hard. Uh, you know, I also go out of my way to try to help them in any way I can. And so when I see that somebody gets an award or, you know, or, uh, uh, or someone does a podcast or they, they finally get with a big publisher after struggling and working on ACX for a long time. Those are really great moments for me. Or when my students, you know, uh, Joe Hempel is one of my students and he, a few weeks ago, he put up on one of the narration Facebook groups about out of the blue, unsolicited. He was like, you know, I, I took this lesson from Sean over a year ago about a very specific thing to do with marking up text. And he said, let me tell you, it just saved my butt on this really difficult book. And then there's that – it's very paternal. It's just you feel like you're, they're your children and they're, they're learning. You know, you, it's you know, when you watch them ride the bike for the first time or tie their shoes, there's a real sense of pride that they did that. They, they took the information. They did the hard work. They moved down the path, and they've, they've seen the payoff. They see the value. They trusted me enough to believe in me and what I had to share – that's a really special feeling that you know uh, that teachers have. I've spoken with my other friends who are teachers, you know, school teachers or college teachers, or they teach whatever, and we all agree that 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 moment when you see a student excel, and when lightning strikes and they're ready for it, they seize the opportunity and move forward. It's 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 magical. It makes all the effort and the grind of having to go and you know listen to the the, the material and teach and you know because sometimes it, it can get a little bit of a be a little bit of a grind but that's more than made up by when you see a student you know have that moment in excel and or send me a private email thanking me for something that you know something magical has happened in their career i i can't tell you how wonderful that is i mean that's like like i said it you know i have two kids of course they're grown now they're 27 and 17 so they they're past a lot of those stages but there really is that that special feeling that uh, I've found nothing that comes close to replacing it. I suppose you've probably had people come up to you and say, you know, I tried reading this book and I couldn't really get through it. But then I listened to you narrate it and it really made all the difference in the world. And I'm sure that's happened and that has to be a good feeling. Oh, yeah. It's nice to hear a listener's 
say – and I get these in reviews where they, they'll say, I tried reading this book several times, couldn't get through it. I heard your audio book and it was I, – I couldn't get enough of it. I think the the biggest one – it's actually – it's a piece of fiction that I did called Infinite Jest by David Foster Wallace in the reviews or I'll get private emails saying exactly that. Like I, I tried to read this book three or four times, couldn't even get a quarter of the way through. So I got your – I didn't hold out much hope when I got the audio book, but it just – sped by and I'm listening to it for the second or third time now and uh, it's a really wonderful wonderful feeling and that's a tremendous thing to say because that is a very lengthy book <laughs> all 57 hours, <laughs> all 57 hours. <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> 57 hours and I couldn't get I enough I tell you that's, I, that's <laughs> high praise people. that's really high praise to me um, that or when they mistake me for the author that's always sort of funny when they think that I was the author, the author's voice, and they forget that I was actually the, the, the narrator on the project. And something else you mentioned on social media recently is you were talking about two different things you were doing, and you said, uh, my job is never boring. So, like, you get a lot of uh, – I've heard you talk about how – you know, you get to sound like you know what you're talking about at a cocktail party if you're reading a book on a topic that's come up and, you know, the subjects change. But, you know, you, you get to pretend like you know something for a little while. So that has to be fun. Oh, yeah. I mean, I, a, lot of the, a lot of those things stick. You know, the really interesting ones stick. That's such a wonderful – I guess that is also the difference – one of the differences why I – between fiction and nonfiction that to me is important – you know, but I was about four years into my career when I really started to make a big transition into nonfiction, and it was that was around the same time I was starting to get a little bored of fiction because I was I was doing sort of the same cowboy story or the same science fiction or the same mystery, and the plots were starting to seem a bit repetitive. But what I love about nonfiction is the intellectual stimulation I get out of it. It's tremendous. You know, I like you know. Do you want to know how they drill for oil in the middle of the ocean? I I can tell you. I did three books about the BP oil disaster. You know, or do you want to understand the physicalization of dealing with PTSD, how it actually affects the body? I did a book called The Body Keeps the Score. It's an amazing book about dealing with PTSD, and so on. You know, um, I've I've I, and if it's a sort of a marketing book or a how-to book, like. How to use social media effectively? Well, guess what? You know, I'm taking notes as I'm doing it. So the, I, to me, I'm, I'm, I'm never bored when I narrate. Now, sometimes you have books that are challenging because uh, the, the topic is so dense or it's poorly written. And that's, you know, poorly written books are very difficult to narrate because our brain is designed to seek patterns. We're, you know, highly evolved pattern seekers. That's how we got out of, you know, being cavemen and, and evolved. Uh, and so when we're reading text, our brain is expecting a certain logical progression of you know verbs and nouns and prepositions and so on. And when we hit something that's missing, it actually sends a signal of like it, – it's a minor kind of sort of like anxiety signal like, oh, that's not right. That's not right. And when you read a book that's poorly edited and has lots of mistakes in it, it's actually – it's more physically uh, taxing to narrate that book for that very reason. It's sort of like that wonderful Warner Brothers cartoon, you know, where uh, Elmer Fudd or Daffy Duck has placed the bomb under the piano. So when they hit, when Bugs Bunny hits that one note on the keyboard, it's going to blow up. And so he plays the, you know, he plays the arpeggio, or whatever, da 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 dink, and he goes, oh no, that's not the right. You know, he says, play it again, da 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 dink, <laughs> and he hits the right note, it blows up. When you hit that off note, it's like that. It's it just grates on your nerves. It drives you insane, you know. Poorly written books or poorly edited books are just horrible. I think there's a great Oscar Wilde quote. I think it's Oscar Wilde. He said, there's no such thing between a moral and an immoral book. Books are either well-written or they're not. When a well-written nonfiction book to me is just a delight, regardless of the genre. And, you know, it fits my temperament well. There's a quote, and it's attributed to Thomas Henry Huxley, and whether he said it or not – you can almost never tell in the internet age unless you do the research, and I haven't done it yet. But the quote jumped out at me uh, regardless, and it sort of speaks to my own interest in nonfiction. 
the the quote is learn something about everything and everything about mm-hmm. something and that's one of those great things that sort of motivates the types of things that I listen to and I can say that you know there are things that I never thought I would have any interest in that you know through the power of an audiobook have just become you know fascinating subjects to me oh absolutely you know I I've learned I've learned about topics I never would have picked up you know at a bookstore uh and they span every genre you can think of you know i i, I did a, a book recently called bogle on mutual funds and uh mr bogle sort of created he he's the founder of the vanguard group which is a an investment firm and they you know invest your money in the wall street and so on and he really create he he was the one who sort of came out with this concept of indexed mutual funds so it's a really it's it's sort of the the genesis book about this idea and i i wrote up on social media i said i've narrated so many books about finance and investing that I actually know what the heck I'm talking about in this book. I've done so many books about investing that it's finally stuck. And so narrating it was a breeze. I knew every single concept he was discussing because I've narrated easily three dozen books on investing and, and uh, finance. Some some stick, but you have to be reminded. And we were kind of talking a little bit about some of those before we started, I was telling you about the first book I heard you narrate. And for the listeners, it was The Extra 2% by Jonah Carey, the baseball writer. And it was about the uh, sort of horrible start to the Tampa Bay uh, Devil Rays, now the Tampa Bay Rays baseball franchise, and how they turned it around using Wall Street strategies. It was really interesting. One of the first books I ever bought off of Audible, as a matter of fact. And uh, I... I when you said that title to me, I'm like, oh yeah, that sounds sort of. Did I did I record that? I don't. Re-, you know, I, after a while, you just can't remember all of them. But that was a good book. Uh, the the topic was very interesting. Yeah. So Sean, before we let you go, I have to go off topic for a question question because uh, I look at your Twitter biography and I see uh, the last few words of it and i just have to know the answer uh the last few words of your uh twitter biography are bad joke teller (laughs) so i need to know are you not good at telling jokes do you tell jokes that aren't funny or is it a cross section of both and i'm hoping it's a cross section of both (laughs) no i did my my daughter got me some socks for father's day recently and it said there's no bad joke like a dad joke and uh, th- so I, I'm notorious for telling shaggy dog jokes. So I can tell a joke well. I just tend to pick jokes that are, you know, the ham sandwich walks into a bar, and the bartender looks at him and says, "I'm sorry, sir, we don't serve food here." Yeah, that kind of. St- <laughs> <laughs> or uh, let's see another one. I have a new favorite right now. Uh, a woman walks into a bar, sits down, and she orders a martini. And the uh, bartender steps away, and she's looking at her phone, checking her email. And suddenly she hears this tiny voice go, oh, your hair is so lovely today. And she looks around, doesn't see anybody, goes back to her phone. Then another voice goes, you know, that dress, that color is wonderful on you. She looks around again, like there's, but there's nobody on the bar. And around that time, the bartender comes back with a drink. And she says, I'm sorry, this may seem really weird, but I keep hearing these voices uh, and there's nobody else here. And the bartender says, yes, uh, yes, madam, it's it's the peanuts. They're complimentary. <sighs> now, they, come on, that killed in Omaha. Come on, come on. Well, <laughs> see, that that's Nebraska. We get up here in South Dakota. And it's, but, you know, my favorite one of those – has always been and it's partially because of my own visual impairment but i always like to tell people so a guy walks into a bar and says ouch (laughs) (laughs) or two guys walk into a bar you think the second one would have stopped that's right a grasshopper uh walks into a bar and hops up on the bar and says uh i'll have a beer and the bartender looks at him and he says, you're not going to believe this, but we've got a drink named after you. And the cricket says, what, do you have a, you have a drink named Phil? So, <laughs> Oh, we could probably do all that day. all day, I'm sure. But 
<laughs> All right. Well, um, <sighs> folks, I hope that as you've listened to this interview, you've uh, come to understand why Sean has uh, gotten the nickname the Ginger Yoda. <laughs> I think that the way you talk about things, especially being so paternal with your students, I think reminded me a lot of a certain Jedi master there. Uh, <laughs> But, um, Sean, I'm going to ask you to do one more thing before we get out of here, and it's something that you know how to do very well. Get in your plugs. Oh, yes. Well, if you'd like to find me, uh, you can spot me online at SeanPrattPresents.com. You can also find me on Facebook at SeanPrattPresents. My Twitter handle is at SPPresents. And if you'd like to send me an email directly, it's Sean Pratt, S-E-A-N-P-R-A-T-T, at Comcast.net. And thank you very much. Check out some of the things we talked about. We will have links to some of the YouTube stuff and uh, the SoundCloud things in the show notes, so you can check those out. Sean, thanks for coming on the show. We'll have to have you back on again because I know for some of these things, we only scratch the bare surface of what we could talk mm-hmm. about, and uh, we could definitely go in depth, and I'm sure we have more humorous <laughs> anecdotes and bad jokes to trade. Uh, but uh, thanks again for coming on the show. This has been a lot oh, of fun. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. We will be back right after this word from Ken with a uh, wrap-up to the show. So uh, we'll be back right after Ken. There are so many ways to get free audiobooks this month. Let me tell you about a couple of them. First, if you're not yet a subscriber to audible.com, just go to audibletrial.com forward slash talkie audiobooks and Audible is giving away a free audiobook with a free 30-day trial. No obligation. Just go to audibletrial.com forward slash talking audiobooks and download your free audiobook along with your first 30 days for free with audible.com. No obligation, no purchase necessary, and you get a free audiobook. How great is that? Well, what's greater than that is, did you know that this month, August, is National Romance Month? Even if you're not in the U.S., which came up with this idea to celebrate romance in the month of August, you can celebrate with us by entering our August Romance Contest to win your choice of four romance audiobooks from audible.com or use them for any kind of books you want. Get your choice of audiobooks from any of your favorite romance authors or choose any four books that you'd like. Just enter. Entering is free. Go to our website, TalkingAudiobooks.com, and on the right side, click on the link that says August Contest. Follow the prompt, enter your email, and you're entered. Good to go. Look for a special way to earn extra entries while you're there. So there you have it. A free audiobook from Audible.com just for trying out a 30-day trial with Audible. And your chance to win four audiobooks of your choice during our August Contest. Hey, free is great. Enter today for your chance to win. If you don't enter, you can't win. And we're back, and thank you, Ken, for that. And again, I want to thank our special guest, Sean Pratt, for giving us his time this week to sit down for an interview. And I hope you enjoyed it as much as I enjoyed recording it. I'm not going to let you get out of here this week without playing some excerpts from our guests this week. And I've picked out three of them. The first one that I'm going to play is the first book that I ever listened to him narrate. Uh, We referenced it in the interview briefly. It is called The Extra 2%, How Wall Street Strategies Took a Major League Baseball Team from Worst to First. It is by Jonah Carey. This comes to us from Dreamscape Media. It was released on June 8th. 2011 and has an approximate running time of nine hours and 43 minutes. This is a book that Sean narrated under the moniker of Lloyd James. It is one that I listened to uh, probably, you know, 10 months after it came out. It was an early audible purchase for me, and it's one that I've gone back to a couple different times because I enjoyed it so much. So, 
Without further ado, here is an excerpt of The Extra 2% uh, narrated by Sean Pratt under the name of Lloyd James. They found a manager who wasn't merely accepting of new ideas. He thrived on them. I see a lot of myself in Sternberg, Silverman, and Friedman. They have accomplished so much in such a short amount of time, turning a perennial loser into one of the top teams in baseball and growing the Rays into one of the model franchises in all of professional sports. Yet no matter what they do in the future, whether it's land a more lucrative TV deal, build a new ballpark, even win a World Series, they'll always trail well behind the Yankees and Red Sox in terms of revenue streams, market size, and national cachet. Despite that reality, they embrace that challenge every day and continue to prove themselves on and off the field. Like me, they're always looking for new, subtle ways to beat the competition. The Tampa Bay Rays are a shining example to anyone, whether you're running a professional sports franchise or a Fortune 500 company or a neighborhood gas station. Every day, they look up and see the two biggest names in their industry standing right on their turf. So they dream up new ideas, whether it's to find a new relief pitcher, improve their brand, or build their profit margin. No one idea is likely to make a huge difference, but collectively, those ideas make the difference between winning and losing, or between winning a little and winning a lot. Those ideas working together result in that little edge the Rays are constantly looking for, that all the best operators are constantly looking for. No matter what kind of business you're trying to run, you should listen to this audiobook. Then you, too, can understand what the extra 2% is all about. Mark Cuban, Dallas, Texas, September, 2010 Prologue I used to tell people I played for the Devil Rays, and they'd ask, Who are the Devil Rays? Now I think they know who we are. B.J. Upton On the first day of spring training in February 2008, Scott Kazmier scanned his team's clubhouse, then swiveled his head back toward a pack of waiting reporters. The assembled media members wanted to know what the young pitching ace thought was possible for the coming season. Really, they wanted their first soundbite of the year. Kazmier was happy to oblige. What's possible? Play in October, that's possible, Kazmier proclaimed. We have what it takes to win here. There is no more optimistic moment in all of sports than the first day of spring training. Refreshed after a long off-season, young men descend on sprawling complexes in Florida and Arizona to catch up with old friends and make new ones. The sun beams down on freshly mown grass. Players slip into freshly laundered uniforms, feel the familiar pinch of their trusty spikes. The gate swings open, and seventy-five pairs of fresh legs saunter onto the field. At that moment, anything is possible. In spring training, every team is undefeated. In that vein, Kasmer's prediction was typical. The flame-throwing left-hander had been hugely successful from the time he first stepped onto a Little League diamond. At 24 years old, he was a first-round draft pick who'd already matured into an elite major league talent, an all-star, the ace of a major league pitching staff, the booty in what was considered one of the most one-sided baseball trades of the decade. Young, talented, handsome, and marketable, he was a few months from signing a contract big enough to leave him set for life. If any baseball player was going to be full of preseason bravado, Kazmir seemed a reasonable choice. That is, until you remembered his employers. For ten years, the team known as the Tampa Bay Devil Rays had plumbed the depths of Major League Baseball, averaging 97 losses a season. They finished last nine out of ten times. When they finished fourth in 2004 with a 70-91 and record, the only time they'd reached 70 wins, it was viewed as a moral victory. The D-Rays traded one of their best players to acquire a manager who left after three losing seasons. They attracted attention only after throwing tens of millions of dollars at washed-up former stars. 
Their owner alienated fans, local media, and local businesses. The Devil Rays were so reviled by players that when Tory Hunter, universally regarded as one of the nicest guys in baseball, was asked about the lucrative contract he'd signed with the Los Angeles Angels of Anaheim. Our next title is another one that we referenced in the interview. This is one that I discovered by going through Sean's social media posts, and I became aware of this book that way, and it jumped out at me, and so it was immediately added to my wish list, and I cannot wait to listen to it. It is called The Death of Expertise, The Campaign Against Established Knowledge and Why It Matters. It is by Tom Nichols. It is from Tantor Audio, was released on May 23rd, 2017. It has a running time of 8 hours and 40 minutes. And here is Sean with an excerpt from The Death of Expertise. There is a cult of ignorance in the United States, and there always has been. The strain of anti-intellectualism has been a constant thread winding its way through our political and cultural life, nurtured by the false notion that democracy means that my ignorance is just as good as your knowledge. Isaac Asimov In the early 1990s, a small group of AIDS denialists including a University of California professor named Peter Duisberg, argued against virtually the entire medical establishment's consensus that the human immunodeficiency virus, known by the acronym HIV, was the cause of acquired immune deficiency syndrome. Science thrives on such counterintuitive challenges, but there was no evidence for Duisberg's beliefs, which turned out to be baseless. Once researchers found HIV, doctors and public health officials were able to save countless lives through measures aimed at preventing its transmission. The Duisburg business might have ended as just another quirky theory defeated by research. The history of science is littered with such dead ends. In this case, however, a discredited idea nonetheless managed to capture the attention of a national leader with deadly results. Thabo Mbeki then the president of South Africa, seized on the idea that AIDS was caused not by a virus but by other factors, such as malnourishment and poor health, and so he rejected offers of drugs and other forms of assistance to combat HIV infection in South Africa. By the mid-2000s, his government relented, but not before Mbeki's fixation on AIDS denialism ended up costing by the estimates of doctors at the Harvard School of Public Health well over 300,000 lives, and the births of some 35,000 HIV-positive children whose infections could have been avoided. Mbeki, to this day, thinks he was onto something. Many Americans might scoff at this kind of ignorance, but they shouldn't be too confident in their own abilities. In 2014, the Washington Post polled Americans about whether the United States should engage in military intervention in the wake of the 2014 Russian invasion of Ukraine. The United States and Russia are former Cold War adversaries, each armed with hundreds of long-range nuclear weapons. A military conflict in the center of Europe, right on the Russian border, carries a risk of igniting World War III with potentially catastrophic consequences. And yet, only one in six Americans, and fewer than one in four college graduates, could identify Ukraine on a map. Ukraine is the largest country entirely in Europe, but the median respondent was still off by about 1,800 miles. Map tests are easy to fail. Far more unsettling is that this lack of knowledge did not stop respondents from expressing fairly pointed views about the matter. Actually, this is an understatement. The public not only expressed strong views, but respondents actually showed enthusiasm for military intervention in Ukraine in direct proportion to their lack of knowledge about Ukraine. Put another way, people who thought Ukraine was located in Latin America or Australia were the most enthusiastic about the use of U.S. military force. These are dangerous times. Never have so many people had so much access to so much knowledge and yet have been so resistant to learning anything. 
in the United States and other developed nations, otherwise intelligent people denigrate intellectual achievement and reject the advice of experts. Not only do increasing numbers of lay people lack basic knowledge, they reject fundamental rules of evidence and refuse to learn how to make a logical argument. In doing so, they risk throwing away centuries of accumulated knowledge and undermining the practices and habits that allow us to develop new knowledge. This is more than a natural skepticism toward experts. I fear we are witnessing the death of the ideal of expertise itself. A Google-fueled, Wikipedia-based, blog-sodden collapse of any division between professionals and laypeople, students and teachers, knowers and wonderers, in other words, between those of any achievement in an area and those with none at all. Attacks on established knowledge and the subsequent rash of poor information in the general public are sometimes amusing. Sometimes they're even hilarious. Late-night comedians have made a cottage industry of asking people questions that reveal their ignorance about their own strongly held ideas. Of course, Sean specializes in nonfiction, but from time to time he still narrates some works of fiction, and I wanted to throw the fiction fans in the audience a bone today, so I thought I'd play an excerpt from a recent release that he narrated in the category of historical mystery. This is called Perish from the Earth, the Lincoln and Speed Mysteries, Book 2. He also narrated Book 1. This is again under the name of Lloyd James. This is a title that was released by Blackstone Audio on July 11th, 2017. It has an approximate running time of 9 hours and 43 minutes, and this historical mystery features a young trial lawyer who goes by the name of Abraham Lincoln, and that name uh, is hopefully familiar to most, if not all of you, listening to this podcast. So here, under the name of Lloyd James, is an excerpt from Perish from the Earth, the Lincoln and Speed Mysteries book two. A Lincoln and Speed Mystery by Jonathan F. Putnam. This book is read by Lloyd James. To three remarkable young men, Gray, Noah, and Gideon, from their proud father. Chapter 1 Though Judge Speed had described the War Eagle to perfection, I almost missed her departure. I strode the dusky St. Louis levee, thickly forested with belching steamboats and bobbing skiffs, frantically searching for a stern-wheel steamer with an oversized bale of cotton placed between twin smokestacks. At the last minute, I saw her, just as the dock hands were casting off her moorings, and I ran at full tilt and leapt toward the receding dock. How different everything might have been if my jump had fallen short and I'd been left to swim back to shore through the Mississippi current. But in October 1837, my legs harbored the spring of a 23-year-old man in his prime. My leap carried me into the webbed rope guard surrounding the main deck. I rested for a moment, breathing heavily. Then I pulled myself up by means of one of the metal posts that ringed the deck, freed my small kit bag from the tangle, and headed upstairs to the hurricane deck. The war eagle was a great beast of the waters, about 150 feet from stem to stern, with twenty staterooms for passengers of means up top, and space below for another two hundred men, women, and children on the main deck. I walked along the promenade, toward the rear of the hurricane, past the dining room, the women's cabin, and the barber shop. The ship was in the center channel of the river, heading north, and a cool autumn breeze blew at my back. At the rear of the ship I leaned out, holding on to the flagpole, and watched the wheel thrash the churning waters. Then I opened the salon door and stepped into an ornate room painted in green and gold, with high ceilings and gingerbread woodwork. All the illumination came from a sparkling cut-glass chandelier, ablaze with several dozen candles. There was not a single window. For all the occupants of the salon knew, they could be brightest noon or blackest midnight outside. As I entered the salon, those occupants were arranged as if posing for a tableau vivant, 
and though I had never met any of them before, I felt certain at once I knew every man present. The gambler was seated on a simple wooden chair behind a slim regency table. His face was lined but clean-shaven, except for a bushy mustache that obscured much of his mouth. His age was indeterminate. Anywhere between thirty years and fifty would have seemed right. He had on a straw hat with a faded blue band running around the base, a dull black frock coat with all three buttons buttoned, and a gray vest and gray trousers underneath. A small portion of the gold chain of a pocket watch was visible underneath the frock coat. He gave the overall impression of a slightly down-on-his-luck planter, except for the cards, which were blazing through his hands like a furnace being fed by three firemen. The gambler was busy throwing the monte, and from the size of the disorderly stack of crumpled bills and assorted gold and silver coins on the table in front of him, it was apparent he was throwing it with skill. Arranged around the gambler were a dozen players and hangers-on. The players sat or leaned against their own chairs, desperately scrutinizing the gambler's moves, certain they could prevail if only they followed his hands closely enough. The observers stood a half-step away and leaned backward, as if the lean on their bodies would be sufficient to protect them from the urge to show they could best the miscreant. All of them shouted with glee as the player in the square made his pick of card. All of them shouted with sorrow when the gambler turned the card and inevitably showed the player he had picked the wrong ticket. Slumped over a chair a few feet away from the gambling table was a drunken fool. His battered straw hat was tipped forward to obscure his face and it rose and fell as he snored. A young artist stood at a three-legged easel off to the side of the gambler's table. He had curly dark hair and a boyishly pudgy face with ruddy cheeks. He held a thick pencil in his right hand, and his eyes darted back and forth between his subject, one of the players at the table, and the half-finished sketch on his board. At the far end of the room, the barkeep stood next to his stand, scanning the crowd around the gambler for the telltale signs of a man in need of additional courage. A few players had abandoned the table altogether and stood clustered around the bar stand, drinking without restraint and no doubt assuring one another their luck would be better the next night. On the wall behind the bar stand was a full-length portrait of General Washington. I hope you have enjoyed listening to those excerpts from audiobooks narrated by our special guest for this week, Sean Pratt. If none of those titles caught your fancy, that's okay. Just head over to your favorite distributor of audiobooks and search for the names Sean Pratt and Lloyd James. And I am quite confident with the number of titles that Sean has done that you will find something that will catch your ear as much as those titles have caught mine. That's going to wrap it up for this week's episode of the Talking Audiobooks podcast. I want to again thank our guest, Sean Pratt, for sitting down with me for an interview. I hope it was as much fun for you all to listen to as it was for me to record. I also need to thank our producer, Ken, for his work on the podcast each and every week. I can honestly say that without his hard work every week, there would not be a Talking Audiobooks podcast for you to listen to. Speaking of listening to the Talking Audiobooks podcast, you can find us at TalkingAudiobooks.com, and you can listen to us there, or you can find the show on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, Spreaker, TuneIn, iHeartRadio, and Google Play Music. If you take the RSS feed off of our website, TalkingAudiobooks.com, you can manually enter it into any podcast aggregator of your choice. Our goal is to be on as many platforms as we can to give you the best possible listener experience. If we are not on a platform and you think we should be, email us at feedback at talkingaudiobooks.com and let us know how you would like to hear the show and we will do our best to make that happen for you, the listener. That's going to wrap it up for this week. I'll be back with an all-new episode of Talking Audiobooks next week. 
Uh, what that episode will be about and who our special guest will be is something that I will keep to myself for the moment. However, if you follow us on Facebook at facebook.com slash talking audiobooks or follow us on Twitter at twitter.com slash talking audio or follow me on Twitter at audiobook Casey and you can find me at Goodreads and Facebook using that same audiobook Casey. That's audiobook C-A-S-E-Y, all one word. Maybe you will notice me dropping a few hints as to episodes to come. I'm very excited about some things that we have in the works here at the podcast. So check out social media and you never know when I might drop a few hints about future episodes. So for myself, for Sean Pratt, for producer Ken Joy, I'm going to end as I always do and just encourage you to keep listening. Talking Audiobooks is a trademark of Kenjoy Media, produced by Kenjoy Media, copyright 2017, all rights reserved. Your host has been Casey Trowbridge, produced by Ken Joy, theme music composed by Christian Anderson, licensed through epidemicmusic.com. Visit our website at talkingaudiobooks.com, follow us on Twitter at Talking Audio, follow us on Facebook at Talking Audiobooks, and subscribe to the Talking Audiobooks YouTube channel. Here's a disclaimer. Various sponsors, like Audible.com, help make this podcast possible. However, they are not responsible for its content, they don't dictate what we talk about or what books we share with you, and therefore the opinions that you hear on here are unfortunately those of the host and our guests. We'd love to hear from you, so email us at feedback at talkingaudiobooks.com. Tell us what audiobooks you're listening to, what you've liked in the past, narrators that you like. Ask us questions, anything. It's for your feedback. Feedback at talkingaudiobooks.com. That's it. See you next time on Talking Audiobooks.